take time today and turn our focus and our attention towards the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Uh, we'll, if you haven't been here for a while, if you haven't, if you've slept since last week or the week before that, um, I'm going to give you just kind of a quick synopsis. We've begun a new sermon series at the beginning of this month, and um, for the lack of a better terminology, we're calling it things that aren't preached anymore. Um, growing up, I used to hear sermons on certain topics, and I haven't heard sermons on those topics for quite a while. Now, uh, this is, uh, some of you will understand what I mean when I say this, this style of preaching is a little outside of my comfort zone. I am much more of what's called exegetical, meaning you take a verse of scripture, you pull it apart, you see what it means, and that's what we relate to each other. Topical is not my forte. Uh, it's, ne it's never really been, and so it's been an interesting search through scriptures. It's, it has challenged my Bible drill abilities to go through on a topic and begin to find verses that match, and uh, going from Old Testament and New Testament both, to match our topic and subject. And so it has proved to be uh, interesting and, and quite eye-opening. Uh, I have One of the things I have found is it doesn't matter how long that I have been reading the Word of God, when I begin to read it again, I find something new. And so uh, it's interesting to learn and to find some new things as we study. Uh, nothing to change, uh, nothing like that, but new knowledge for us to gain. And so we've talked about... Um, <coughs> now on Mother's Day last week we talked about hell, which was an exciting time. And uh, uh, if you want to go back and listen to that, my voice is not all that great. But you can go to the website and pull it up. You can listen to the audio and uh, watch video as well. It's not any shorter, but uh, at least you can pause me. But uh, that's a whole different ball of wax there. So this morning it is, uh-huh. And today, uh, what we're going to look at and uh, where we're going to be is a familiar verse of Scripture. Probably all of us know it by heart. But the problem is, is that we're going to use and talk about a word that isn't spoken of anymore. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to look at it. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody wants to be around it. But here's what we know. And the, the, the source material that we're going to preach and talk about is from the scriptures. Um, I have not one. I, I went down and sat yesterday with a, a group of men. And we began to discuss a few things in a men's ministry meeting that I led yesterday morning and uh, had opportunity of preaching it, uh, and to them. And we just, we talked about what does God tell men and uh, began to say, we have some preconceived notions of culture about what men should and should not be, do or say, and we need to throw those out because culture changes, the word of God does not. And so we need to base what we do on the word of God. And so... Things that aren't preached anymore. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Most all of us should know this verse of Scripture. Most all of us should at least have a reference. If you have been here while I have been preaching here, this should be a familiar verse to you because I used it and have used it and will continue to use it quite often. If you want to, in big block letters on your sermon note page, there's your title. Sin. That's the whole context of the sermon. Sin. As we go through and read through the verses of Scripture today, we will be reminded that this book we are soon to read from is not simply a word from God, but it is the word of God. There is none like it, none beside it, none needs to be added to, and certainly none be taken away from. It is the living two-edged sword that is the word of God. And out of respect for the holy living word of God, I would invite you, if you are able to, to stand for its reading. If you are unable to stand, please understand that nobody going to come and, and get on to you. If you're ready for God's word, would you say amen? amen? All sin and fall short of the glory of God. 
God bless our time together. Bless the reading of your word. We ask that the scripture would be fulfilled, that every word that comes from you would not return to you void, but will accomplish the things that you have sent it forth to do. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the living word that was Christ incarnate, made flesh. We thank you for the power the word has to get into the very center of our being. And we ask today that we would leave here differently because of the truth of your word. Let us see you and see us. And let us realize the difference is Christ. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. And amen, and you may be seated today. I'm going to uh, give you some definitions. I'm going to give you some information today. And I want you to get uh, 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 an understanding of why we don't hear sin from the pulpit anymore. When Mr. Webster wrote the dictionary for the United States, way back in the early 1800s, as he began to write it, what he said was, I want to create an American lexicon. He didn't want to use English language because, you know, we had separated from them. didn't want to talk like the British. He wanted to talk like America. Y'all know what that means, right? Okay. And so he began to put a dictionary in place. And if you go back and read the original Webster's Dictionary definition of sin... Here is what he defined as sin in the early 1800s. Transgression against divine or moral law, iniquity, evil, or to depart from the path of duty prescribed by God. That was the definition that if you were in school and wanted to define a word, when you opened the dictionary it said it's a violation of God's law. That's what sin was described to be. In the new modern Webster's Dictionary, here is the definition. Transgression against moral law. If you're a seventh grade and go to the library at your school, or like everybody wants to do, just pull out the phone and go to Google, that's what the new Webster's Dictionary defines sin as. If you go like so many of those of us who live in the generations in which we do, go to your phone and look up, I believe it's called Culture Map, which is a a, a lexicon of today's modern language. And you ask the masses the definition of the word sin. To do wrong. We have come a long, long way in 200 plus years from the definition of sin to to do no wrong. (coughs) Churches today will not use the word sin. There are churches who believe and preach, and I'm not making this up, I've been in the church, that once you get saved, you don't sin any longer. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. There are churches who preach and believe that there's no real thing as sin. It's not a reality. We talked last week about hell and there's churches who don't believe in hell. If there's no hell to be sent to, by logic, that means there's no sin because you, if there's no place to go when you sin, that means sin can't be real. It's about a 40%, uh, I think it's like 37% of uh, Christians, evangelical Christians, do not believe in real sin. Why? Or their dictionary says to do no wrong. Well, if there is no absolute right or absolute truth, what is wrong? Wrong's whatever you think it is. 
So what is wrong for me that I believe, may not, you may not believe it's wrong and so it's okay for you to do. That means there is no line in the sand. There is no way to say this is absolutely wrong and this is absolutely right. And so the concept of sin just evaporates. Because for 50 years our churches have refused to preach on sin. The nuts and bolts of sin. What does the scripture call sin? What is the reality of sin? That's today. I hope your writing fingers are in good shape. That's it. Miss Gertrude, click the pen. Get, it, get, it, get ready. We're going to look at what the scripture calls sin. What is sin described as? How do we go through this? And so that's where we're going to begin. And so we're going to just get some basic information. What does the Old Testament call sin? I cannot give you every scripture reference because it would literally be tomorrow before we got finished. But let's look at three things. The word that in Hebrew that is translated as sin. <laughs> if you are reading through the Old Testament, it is written in Hebrew and or Aramaic. And the word in the Hebrew that we understand as sin is the word kata. And it gives three word pictures. Kata is called three different things. Number one, it's a word picture of what it means to forfeit. Now this is not an understanding of a baseball team without enough players. It could be better translated as bereft. Meaning that there is a lack of. When it talks about living in sin in Habakkuk, when it says God cannot look upon sin, when it talks about it all throughout the book of Psalms, when David committed the sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, when Absalom sinned, when Moses sinned, when Noah sinned, the word there, every time we see that, we have an understanding of there being, being forfeit of something. What are they forfeit of? What are they bereft of? It's a moral guide, a moral compass. They chose and had a will not to do what was right. They made an effort to do something wrong. They, were, they forfeited the glory of God. God made a plan. You'll remember the narrative. God made a plan and said, you're going to leave out of Egypt's bondage. You're going to go and you're going to possess the promised land. I have given it to you already. I have promised it to you. It is yours for the taking. Just go there. And so they went. Went straight to Kadesh Barnea. And instead of doing what God said, they said, well, let's do this and let's go send spies in. God didn't say to send spies. So they sent the twelve. One from each tribe. Ten of them said, uh-uh. That's East Texas. Ain't going to happen. Joshua and Caleb said, wait a minute, God told us to go, let's go. For 40 years, everybody died except for Joshua and Caleb because they sinned against God. They forfeited the plan and the will of God. The second one we understand is they're lacking. Mm. I saw this on social media. Some of you will, will, will get this and especially since we are all uh, kind of similar in mindset, I saw a thing that had a Ziploc bag for sale, and in it, in it had a roll of duct tape and a can of WD-40. And it said, it, said a, it said fix all. If it's supposed to move and it doesn't, you put WD-40 on it. If it moves and is not supposed to, you use duct tape. Why not? The issue is some things take different tools. And if you are lacking that specific tool, it sure does make your life a, a whole lot harder. Uh, we, uh, we were working on vehicles in our yard. My father is a huge fan of the musical uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And we always sing this song when we're working on vehicles, If I Were a Rich Man. Yeah, da, 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 da. And the next line is, I wouldn't be doing this stinking work. We wrote that line. 
Because if we were able to afford it, we would take our vehicle to someone else and have them repair it. Instead, we have to. But we don't have a large snap-on tool set that the man comes and replenishes every week. We have my dad's toolbox. And when you go to find a certain tool, sometimes you have to take a screwdriver and put a bend in it with a torch and a hammer to get it to work like you need to because we are lacking the proper tools. What happens is, is when we begin to read the Old Testament, the, when it says they were lacking, when it, was, it means that they were empty of or they were void of. When it says they failed or they sinned against God, it meant they were lacking the Holy Spirit of God in their lives. One of the very things, one of the very entrenched parts of the law was not to have anything to do with astrology or mediums or witches or anything like that. Saul, the king, the leader of Israel, who was supposedly God's chosen, chose to ignore the law and go in. He was lacking wisdom and he was lacking the spirit of God. And he went and found the witch at Endor and Samuel comes up and says, Man, what the heck are you doing? That's East Texas. He was lacking and he sinned against God. And then it means to be led or to lead astray. We all know this. We all understand. If you've been in any vacation Bible school, you remember the, the, the pledge to the Bible, I will hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, that only works if you follow where the light goes. Bethany's not here, so I can talk about her. To this day, Bethany, when she is driving, if she turns her head, to look at something. Her whole body turns. And if you're driving and you turn the wheel, the car moves. And Bethany will drive smooth clean off in the ditch because she was looking at something because she can't turn her head but keep her hand straight. So I said, don't turn your head. Driving down the road requires you to stay on the road. When we were in uh, Clovis, New Mexico, and we would drive into Texas, either at Amarillo, Lubbock, or home, or Oklahoma, or wherever we were going, as soon as you cross the border into Texas, there are big signs on the side of the road that says, Danger! Deep sand off of road. And if you get one tire, you will get all of them into that sand, and you're done. You're stuck. Because we have gone astray. What does the scripture say? All we like sheep have gone astray, each of us to own to our own separate ways. That means a sin against God. God has a plan for us, and if we don't follow it, <coughs> it is considered to be sin. Literally, it means to have a way, but choose your own. What does the New Testament say about sin? The Greek, Greek word translated as sin is hamernato. That's a great word. Hamernato, and it means, it means the same thing every time it's used. If you open the New Testament, you read the word sin. It's the same word every single time. And it's an archery term that means to miss the mark. <coughs> Back in the, the Roman Empire, one of the things they would do is they would hang a silver denarius, one of, you know, pretty much a day's wages, they would hang it on a target. And you would walk so many paces away and you would begin to fire arrows at that target. And if you hit it, you got to keep it. Didn't matter if you nicked it. You had to pierce the center. I went for my handgun certification. I went to go get my CHL. And you have to make 250 to get perfect. Not to be perfect. That woman looked at me and dead in the face and said, 249. I said, no. That's 250. She said, 249. I said, that is 250. She said, I'll give you 249 and a half. I picked, we, looked, we put that target up so the light came through. And it was touching the black circle on the paper. And she said, it's 249 because you hit part of the black. I said, show me. That's in, that's, there's no black paper, and there was like one little tiny fiber of black paper that was side, and she said 249. I had missed the mark. 
I had missed perfection. I passed, but I missed perfection. Christ, to his disciples and followers in John chapter 3, said, Be perfect, because I am perfect. 249 doesn't cut it. Anything less than perfection is falling short of the glory of God and all sin. We all miss the mark. That's what the scripture says. That's the examples we have. So now that you understand the verbiage that is used for sin, let's get down into some Bible drill. Get ready. If you're going to flip pages, lick your thumb now because you're going to need it. What are the nuts and bolts of sin? What does it look like for us on a day-to-day basis? We don't call sin, sin any longer. In the scriptures, it was called sin. Period. There was no way to get around it. We have lost the understanding of the word sin. Why is, it, why is that the way things are? Three verses, of, well, two verses of scripture. Romans chapter 1, verse 25 says this, that... People have exchanged truth for a lie. (coughs) Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We are told that there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved in the name of Christ. And yet all you have to do is turn on any of these so-called preachers on the radio or television, and you will hear time and time again that that may not be the way things are. Jesus is a way to get to heaven. A pastor of a multi-million dollar church in the greater Houston area said this, I will not preach on theology. We believe if you smile enough, people will know you go to church. What the heck does that have to do with sin, salvation, heaven, or hell? Smiling doesn't save anyone. And yet if you smile enough, everybody will think you're happy and everything will be okay. You off your meds. Because the truth that Christ is the only way to salvation has been exchanged for the lie that as long as you're sincere, you'll get to go to heaven. Because there is no hell, so that's the only option for you. That is a lie. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3. You guys will understand what this means. We have itchy ear syndrome. There is coming a time when people will not endure sound doctrine. Instead they're going to pay folks to tell them what they want to hear. Our church seating capacity. We had 150 people in here Easter Sunday morning. We don't today. But there are churches who will be slam-packed full, who have to have multiple services over multiple days to fit everybody who wants to go in there, and the Word of God will never be opened from the pulpit. Because truth has been exchanged for a lie. And quite frankly, we like the lie better than we like the truth. Because the truth means there's a God and we're responsible. But the lie means we can do what we want to. Tell me if you've ever heard any of these phrases. Well, it's okay. I just have a bad habit. God understands. It's okay. It's just who I am. No, it's just a character flaw. Or the devil. Did. Listen, we have bad habits, but those bad habits come from sin. The personality traits that we exhibit come from sin. What does the scripture say? Out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. Character flaws. Yes, we have character flaws because we are human. And we are bound in a sin nature because sin entered once through Adam. And I'll just be honest with you, we give the devil way too much credit. And when we give him too much credit, it gives him too much power. We need to step up and say, this is my choice, and I am going to do what I want to do. And as Paul wrote in the book of Romans, there are things that I do that I don't want to do, but I do them anyway. 
And the things I ought to do, I don't do because I don't want to do them. It's not that the devil is making us. It's that we're choosing to do what we ought not to. Because we have exchanged the truth for a lie. Sin is still sin. It doesn't matter what culture map says. It matters what the Word of God says. Why don't we say sin anymore? Because people get mad. Some of you are very uncomfortable today. Because we're talking about this subject. It makes people squirm. This is not a fuzzy feel good message. Because we're talking about sin. First John. Chapter 1 verse 8 says this. If someone says they do not sin, then they are a liar. How many of you like to be called a liar? Does anybody like to be told that you're wrong? I don't like to be told I'm wrong. That's why I'm never wrong. Why do my children look at me like that? If we began to water down what sin is by, well, it's just, it's just who I am and I can't help it. You're right, you can't help it, but he can, but you've got to let him do it. That doesn't mean we ever get away from sin. And when we begin to be told <coughs> that you are a sinner, those who are lost don't want to be told that. Why have we lost the awe of God? Because if there is a God, that means there's somebody in control. And if there is somebody in control, that means when we violate His law, we are guilty. And nobody wants to be guilty. We just all want to go to heaven get a harp and a crown and sing kumbaya on our clouds all over for eternity. That's not biblical at all. That's a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 19 gives this marvelous phrase. An angry brother is hard to work with. Then it says that contention is a walled castle with iron bars. Man, what between brothers causes contention? Sin. We won't go down that road, but Proverbs tells us there are six things the Lord hates and a seventh that is detestable unto him. And the seventh is this, a man who stirs dissension among the brethren. When we begin to confront sin and talk about sin and being around sin, it causes conflict because nobody likes to be told they're wrong. And it causes anger. And when we get angry, we shut up, we shut, we shut down, we don't want to listen. We want to, we want to holler louder than everybody else because we think for some reason that's going to fix it or change it. And it doesn't work. And we begin to sin and it becomes difficult. So what are they angry for? What are they angry about when we begin to talk about sin? There's an interesting word used. We've talked about this passage of Scripture. In Matthew chapter 18, we have that if your brother sins against you, go to them. Try and resolve it. If it doesn't work, take two or three. Go back, try and resolve it. If it doesn't work, you bring it before the church. If it doesn't resolve, then you treat them as a publican and a tax collector, meaning you excommunicate them from the church. You kick them out. There's an interesting word that is used, though, that we gloss over a lot. It says, if, a, if your brother offends you... Go and confront them. That word is a word of, of strife. Because we go, nobody likes to go into conflict. So when you go to your brother and you begin to say, Brother Daryl, this is not true. Brother Daryl, you've sinned against me and I've sinned against you and we need to resolve this. And he says, no, I haven't. And I say, yeah, you did. There's conflict that arises. Again, that's not true. But conflict arises. Conflict arises, people get angry. When people get angry, the Scripture says in Ephesians, be angry, but do not sin in your anger. That means resolve it, work it out. Why do we, what, Sin, what does it mean, don't sin in your anger? Don't miss the perfection of God because you're angry. We don't use sin because we can't call it that anymore. People get angry with sin. And then we, we try and rationalize our sin. 
I, I've got news for you. There is not one sin that is worse than another. Now, there are temporal differences in sin. But not eternal differences in sin. There is not a deeper pit of hell for those who perform one sin versus a smaller pit of hell for someone who does this sin. Sin is sin is sin and hell is hell is hell and it is all the same. But the theft of a pencil does not equate temporally to the theft of a child. There are different consequences temporally for that. But in eternity, there is no difference between the thief of something small and the thief of something large. A thief is a thief. And the the very nature of stealing goes against the character of God. It does not matter what it is. It is against God's will, plan, and very nature. What that means for us is this, that abortion is just as wrong as lust. Gossip is just as wrong as homosexuality. Drunkenness is just as wrong as lying. Because sin is sin is sin. Temporally, the consequences are different than eternally. And I can prove it. James chapter 4, verse 17 If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin. It's echoed in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 9. If anyone turned his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer is sin. Think about that for a minute. When you do what the scripture says is wrong, your prayers even are considered an abomination before God. In Ezekiel, the prophet of God is given this revelation. The people are asking God and they're beseeching God and God is not answering them. And Ezekiel says, God, why aren't you answering? And God says, tell the people this. Thus saith the Lord. You have erected idols between your face and my face. Why should I listen to you at all? Psalm 66, 18. If I harbor sin in my heart, God will not hear me. Because sin causes disruption. And it doesn't matter the sin. Sin is and shall always be sin. If the word of God never changes, that means the truth in it never changes. And the truth is sin is sin is sin and will be for all of eternity. There are three things that sin causes that nobody wants to talk about. Why don't we talk about sin anymore? Because it causes us to realize a couple of things. Number one, in Romans chapter 6, the first part of verse 23 says, The wages of sin, the payment due for sin, not the penalty of sin, but what you earn for sin is death. The word means separation from life. And I realize that may seem like, well, duh. When you're dead, you're not alive. But it's deeper than that because the word means separated from life. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the life. When we die in this kind of death, we are separated from the life for all of eternity. That is sin. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12. Sin through one man and death through sin. And because all men have sinned, sin leads to death. And death is unto all men. It's the same word, separated from life. And then we have a terrifying verse of Scripture. Hebrews chapter 10. We all know verse 25. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, which is the habit of some, but instead encourage each other all the more as you see the day approaching. Then you shift gears. Because verse 26 says, For if we continue to sin once we have been shown the truth, there is no sacrifice left for sin. Only (coughs) the only thing that is left (coughs) 
is to be judged, and in verse 27 it says, in fiery indignation. It's hell. Hell is separation from life, therefore it is death. Nobody likes to talk about death. We just all want to talk about how wonderful heaven will be. Heaven will be wonderful for those who are there. But wide is the road and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. Many there shall find it. So what does sin look like? All that was introduction. Let's get into the sermon today, shall we? What does sin look like? According to Scripture, what does sin look like? Did you know there's such a thing as a national sin? As a country, as a nation. Proverbs 14.34, righteousness exalts a nation. That's not the end of the verse, though. See, we want, we want to put that on a bumper sticker. The rest of the verse says, but, this is the wrong side of the but. But sin is a disgrace. To any people. Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a disgrace. That word literally means a weight around the neck. A millstone if you will. It is a disgrace to any people. National sin causes disgrace. We won't get into, into the political arena. We won't get into anything else. But what we will get into is this. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If we want to change our country, it will only change from the heart of the church, not from the voting booth. But church, you need to hear me. The only way to do that as a church is to go to the voting booth and vote biblically. I know this is not an electoral season, but hear me. If you don't vote you don't get to complain because you didn't do your job. National sin. There's also personal sin. This one we understand, but I think it's deeper than we know. When Achan, you remember the sin of Achan when Ai came and, and beat the children of Israel? In Joshua chapter 7, verse 20, God had made all the nation, the nation come by tribe, by house, and then he finally winds up on Achan. And Joshua says, what have you done to anger the Lord? And Achan answered Joshua and said, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did. Personal. The devil didn't make him do it. By the way, Adam and Eve didn't sin because the devil did it. They did it because they wanted to, because the fruit looked good. There is secret sin. Psalm 90, verse 8. David writing, You have placed our iniquities before you, O God. Our secret sin in the light of your presence. You need to understand there is no such thing as a secret sin because God sees everything. And that verse of Scripture says He lays it before Him. He knows. National sin. Personal sin, secret sin, there is open sin. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 24 says, The sins of some men are evident. They go before them to judgment, and for others their sin follows after. What that means, that word, when it means evident, it means it's showing. It's visible. In the context of the churches they were going then, they would paint themselves and they would adorn themselves in a certain fashion because as a part of the worship in Ephesus, at the temple, the pagan temple there, they had temple prostitution. And as a form of your worship to that God, you would go in and, and invite a prostitute to come with you. And that would be your form of worship. But you didn't go in dressed in, you know, hermit robes. You went adorned for the activities that you were about to engage in. And as they walked down the middle of the street, everybody knew what they were doing. And the scripture says, it is sin. 
what used to be called sin, we now parade, we now openly embrace, and we now think nothing of it. I remember a time when you wouldn't be able to turn on the television and hear the language that comes on television today. And you wouldn't see the type of programming that is on television today. And it's even got into the place where it's on radio, even in print. Because it's open sin, because we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Shameless sin. Isaiah chapter 3 verse 9, the expression of their face bears witness against them. They display their sin like Sodom. They do not even conceal it. Woe unto them. Walking around in open, shameless, wanton sin. Some of you have seen the pictures on social media and in print. They've had pictures of women holding signs that say, I just had my whatever number of abortion and I'm happy. Open, shameless sin. Some of you I know have seen it said that uh, I will be glad to go to hell. Billy Joel used to sing a song where that he would rather be in hell with the sinners than have to put up with the saints. Shameless. It is also understood there's public sin. 2 Samuel 16, 22. Absalom. In the revolt of Absalom, he went in, they pitched a tent in the middle of the city. And it says that he lay with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. For everyone to see, he sinned against his father. There is an unforgivable sin. Matthew 12 tells us this. The unforgivable sin is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Anything can be forgiven be through the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. But when you reject the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ, you are blaspheming saying, God, you, I don't need you at all. You blaspheme and call of the Holy Spirit, and that shall never be forgiven is what Christ said. And all of it is wrapped up in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Willful sin. Everyone who practices sin, that word practice means choose to do over and over again. We, it is practice as in, I'm going to work at this until I'm good at it. Everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness because lawlessness is sin. When we violate the law and the word and the... <clears throat> the rich glory of the text of God, we sin. Because anything outside of the Word of God is sin. So what does this mean for us today? Because, just to be honest, that was not very fun to go through. Because unless you are perfect... And none of you are. You fall into one of those categories. Or some of us fall into some of those categories. Because all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So what does it mean for us today? Well, I'm not going to leave you, you know, down in the mully groves. Is that still a term that is, you know, some of you know what that means. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm just going to go sit and eat worms. Let me share some reality with you. If we preached on sin more often, we would be able to preach on these scriptures a whole lot more. And boy, it would be much better. How can you deal with sin? You can't. You can't. The best that we can do in our righteousness is but filthy rags in the sight of God. can only trust in Jesus. So what does trusting in Jesus do? What does that have to do with our sin? Let me give you some, some good news. He blots our sins from our account, says Isaiah. One of the best verses of Scripture in the, all, all of the Bible is Micah chapter 7, verse 19, and it says this. 
God will cast, literally He will throw away our sin. It's not the same as the psalmist wrote that He will cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. Micah says that God will take our sin and in good East Texas vernacular, He's going to chuck it. He blots out our sin. He casts our sin away from us. Exodus 34, 7, God will forgive all of our sins. Jeremiah 31, He will remember our sin no more. 1 John chapter 1, we are cleansed and He will wash our sins away. Matthew chapter 1 says this, I have been saved from my sin. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 says that Christ gave Himself to cover our sin. He who knew no sin wrote... <coughs> wrote Peter, became sin for us. The good news of sin for us is encapsulated in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. If we will confess our sins, then He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. We have it in the New Testament. The Old Testament says, says the same thing in Isaiah's writing. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins were as scarlet. That shall be as white as snow. The truth and the reality of sin is very simple. It is everywhere. It is total and absolute in its conviction. It is complete in its ruination. And we like it. Because if we didn't, we wouldn't do it. And yet the glory of Romans chapter 5 verse 8. That while we were yet sinners. Christ died 